Hey, Alyssa, this is uh, so great to have you here. This is Scott Barber with the Landscape Ontario podcast. We're doing something new. We're recording on Zoom to have some video here. Uh, I'm at the yellow office in Milton. I think you're at your home office. Uh, is it in Kitchener, Waterloo, I think, somewhere around there? And um, I've brought you in here today to talk about uh, probably the biggest issue uh, facing every trade, every skilled trade, and landscaping, horticulture is no different. That's uh, recruitment. And I know you're going to be speaking at Congress coming up in just a few weeks, which I'm super excited about. Uh, but I wanted to bring you in to do a little bit of a sneak preview to talk a little bit uh, about what you're going to be doing on recruitment. So if you wouldn't mind just uh, telling me a little bit about how you think landscapers can hire great people. What are some of the strategies they should be thinking about? First of all, thank you so much for having me, Scott. I love being on podcasts, so this is super fun. And, you know, one of the things that I talked about at Hort East a few weeks ago when I spoke there was the importance of using an adjective in the job title of whatever you're posting. And that adjective needs to be both congruent with your culture and what you're looking for and also be measurable. Because if it's not measurable, you can have a human rights issue. What does that mean? Yeah, what does measurable mean in this context? Yeah, so let's look at, give me a job title in the landscaping industry. So it could be, um, you know, maintenance technician. Or, perfect. Yeah. Super. Okay, well, sure, maintenance technician is perfect. And what kind of person would somebody be looking for in a maintenance technician? Describe them. Right, I think somebody that uh, has a good attention to detail, mm -hmm. um, that is able to work in a team, somebody mm -hmm. that um, is motivated uh, and yeah, ready to work hard. Okay, so if you were to sum that up, what would you say? Because right now those are pretty generic. You're right. I think I might need some help on this. I'm glad I'm, I'm not writing the job. I did have <laughs> writing job uh, uh, titles. Um, how would I sum that up? Uh, something about being, you know, a self-starter, um, you know, I don't know. You tell me, help me. <laughs> okay. So the word that comes for me is like independent. Okay. I okay. Like it. Now independent can be a bit of a tricky word because it can sound like a subcontractor position. So you need to make sure that you describe that really uh, beautifully inside the job description. Right. But if we look at it just for what it is, so you're looking for somebody who's independent and they're independent because we want them to be motivated. We want them to be a self-starter. We want them to be detail oriented. And so inside of the job description, you say, at our company, this is how we define and measure independence. Mm -hmm. So then you list all of those things and say how they'll be measured. So when it comes up to their evaluation, you can say, look, these are, this is how we said we were going to measure independence. We were going to talk about detail oriented. Well, how many big mistakes have you made and not been able to recover from or we needed help or that cost us money. And, and certainly sometimes when people make mistakes, like that's part of the learning experience. Sure. We're talking about after the learning period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if we're talking about somebody who's a self-starter. So are you there every day that you're assigned to be there? And are you doing that with a great attitude? And what does a great attitude look like? It looks like you coming prepared to work. So you have the energy to do the job you need to do. And those things are measurable. Right. So is the key to the adjective in the job description is it is it the you know grabbing someone's attention and and grabbing the right person's attention is that is that the idea it's definitely part of it and the reason that it works so well scott is it's because it because it's like holding up a filter so if i'm going to if i'm going to look for a job let's say with team leader okay so pretty generic job title okay and i go oh i don't know i, I think i might like that but then somebody rewrites and it says dynamic team leader. If I don't identify as dynamic, I'm not applying for that job, right? So it's an extra filter. So with the maintenance technician, an independent maintenance technician, oh gee, I, you know, I'd much rather work on a team than as an independent, you know? So there, there are different ways that, that people think about those adjectives when they look at them in a job title. Right, right. Okay, so tell me more about what business owners should be thinking about when they're writing that, when they're writing that, I guess, headline, essentially that, mm -hmm. that description that's going to show up on a job board or, or what have you. And also you mentioned a couple things about what they're thinking about when they're actually writing that description. Mm -hmm. 
So I have to tell you, I need you to ask me one question at a time. I have ADD and it's really hard for me when people ask two questions. So I need you to ask me one question at a time. Okay. So really it was, it was, if you could go more into detail about what the actual job description is then going to look like. Okay. Let's just do that first. Awesome. And thank you for listening to me and, and respecting that. So in the job description, I mean, let's think about this people. If I ever read other duties as assigned again, right? Because other duties as assigned could be an executive director who then is assigned to scrubbing toilets. And that doesn't make sense. So instead of saying other duties as assigned inside your job description, what you want to do are say other things inside the realm of and give some examples. Okay. So maybe if paperwork isn't normally part of uh, a general laborer's job, then perhaps what we need to say is, you know, completing paperwork at the end of jobs or being able to check, you know, work orders or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you know, that a key, a key, key, key component to writing a job description is in the first line, if you are, and then describe the person you're looking for. If you want to work with, describe your company. Job descriptions can be so exciting to read. And for anyone who's like rolling their eyes right now, I will bring an example of the most beautiful job description I have ever seen written. I mean, it is incredible. And it doesn't have to take a lot to write it. It just has to really be about your company. So what does that look like? What, when you're thinking back at that beautiful job description, what did it say? I just saw you roll your eyes at me a little bit for anyone who's listening not, and not never. watching. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would never, no. <laughs> teasing. So as we go back and look at look at those job descriptions, that job description that I was talking about, you know, one of the things that's really beautiful about it is it's written for people to filter themselves. Okay. So there's no adjective in that job title, although I would love to see one there. But it was very much like, this is who our customers are. This is why they matter to us. If you can't get on board with this, please don't apply. Right? right? Like if what we want, if it doesn't matter who we're taking money from, like who our customers are, whether they're short, tall, thin, wide, old, young, you know, an immigrant or, you know, someone who's been here a long, like, do you know what I mean? Like it doesn't matter who we're, we're taking our money from and who our customers are, then why does it matter who we're hiring? Right. Because here's the thing, if we hire, let's say some immigrants, for example, what we know is that their community is going to hear who's hiring them and they're going to support the people that are hiring them. Right. Right. Or if we're going to give some teenagers a chance who are doing, you know, a, a specialist program in high school or in college or university in landscaping and word gets out that we hire young people, then people who want to support young people will call us to do business with them. Right. So that's why we want to tell the story of who our customers are and what our teams look like inside of job descriptions, mm -hmm. because that's how we can better support our communities as well. Yeah. So who would you say for looking ahead to, to the Congress uh, conference, who, who are the, who's the audience that you, that your talk is geared towards who should be coming? If you own a business or you're responsible for doing the hiring any step of the way, then definitely this workshop is for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what are you looking most forward? What do you, what do you enjoy about taking part in Congress? This is, I guess, how many, how many Congress have you been to? Uh, this will be the third one I've been to to be the second speaking at. And yeah. then I also was, I was the keynote speaker at the irrigation conference and at Hortys this year. What do you enjoy about, working with the landscape and horticulture community, do you think? I, here's what I know. I mean, I used to be a tradesperson and there are no friendlier people than tradespeople. And, you know, like shirt off your back, kind of hard work in people that often are just so misunderstood. And the thing that I love most about being in these sectors is that I get to spend time with people that understand me and that I understand. And, you know, I don't speak corporate. I don't pretend to speak corporate. And so being able to, you know, be at LO is such a privilege because I feel like I'm with my people again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell me about the background. You said you were a tradesperson. What did, what, what did that look like? Uh, I was uh, a goldsmith. 
So that's my trade. <laughs> yeah. Oops, yep. So I, uh, I went to school for, I won a government award to start a business when I was 17 after making beaded jewelry for several years. And, you know, 20, 25 years ago, there was a big gap in the market. So I did really well through high school selling um, beaded jewelry. And so I started my, uh, started my business at 17. I won a summer company award for anyone familiar. It's a, or not familiar, I should say it's a government program for young people to start businesses and then went off to college and went to Georgian for goldsmithing, uh, did the 20th anniversary gifts for blue rodeo while I was there. Um, couple, couple of honorable mentions for some design work and, and my work was sold in galleries across the country. Very cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So what did, what did blue rodeo get? Was it for the band itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, uh, I lived in this little teeny tiny town with no stoplights and uh, some folks moved in across the street and they had this big yellow house, okay? Like you can't miss it because everything else is gray and brown on that particular road. And um, anyway, it was called Mad Michael's Tree Art Cafe. And at Mad Michael's, um, his, they used to be the booking agents for a whole bunch of big Canadian bands and we're still the booking agent for Blue Rodeo. And so they came to me and said, hey, will you make um, bolo ties for, for the guys for the 20th anniversary? And, uh, and I said, absolutely, I will. And so we did, uh, we did bolo ties for all members of the band. Very cool, I love it. I, uh, I'm fortunate to see them in Toronto this past summer. Oh, great. yay, that's great. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay, so Congress is coming up in a few weeks. Uh, you already mentioned business owners. Let's let's maybe dive just a little bit more into, you know, why do you think it is so such a challenge for the trades to attract talent? What do you do? You have thoughts on that? I do, but I have to say one thing so I don't forget. Is that okay? Go right ahead. So uh, one of the things that I do at Congress is I always speak in the morning. Actually, anywhere I go, I speak in the morning. And that's because all afternoon, every 10 to 15 minutes, I spend with different business owners through the day. And they, we just book them right after I speak. So if you want to come and want one-on-one -on -one help with whatever you're dealing with in your business, recruiting, hiring, marketing, whatever it is, um, then we can do that in the afternoon. And there's no charge for that. So I just want everyone to know that. Very cool. Very cool. It's a lot of fun. That's one of my favorite parts of, of speaking. Um, okay. So your question was? Why do you think it is such a challenge for the trades? Mm. Like not just landscaping, but not just virtually landscaping. every, every skilled trade mm -hmm. thoughts on why it is such a challenge to re to recruit talent and, and labor. So I think the honest truth is that unfortunately tradespeople have been painted with a certain brush. And that is that we are, you know, not as smart. So we, you know, go into the trades or, you know, we are, uh, you know, not able to sit in a classroom. So we go in the trades and somehow we're less than. Right. And, you know, that's changing, uh, especially with people like Jamie McMillan going across the country, across North America, talking about, you know, trades um, for young people as first career options. Uh, I think really though, what we need to do is, is change the conversation by changing how we display who we are and what we do. So, you know, I think about my brother who really struggled in school and ended up at a, a more vocational high school. And he would practice his violin in the auto bay because it was the only place the school would let him. And then he ended up loving auto and now he fixes tanks in the army. Wow. And so if I think about, you know, how we can start people young, earlier, what we need to do is give our time to young people and say, you know, here's an option that you may not have explored. You know, landscaping isn't about digging holes or planting trees. There's so much more to it than that. You know, they don't understand that, you know, people who really love maths might be really great at installing irrigation systems. Uh, you know, people who are really great at chemistry might be really good with learning how different plants and different soils go together the best way in certain environments, you know, and, you know, I just think there are so many fascinating aspects of it that if we are to grow our industry, trades, landscaping, what we need to do is break it down into individual really interesting projects and aspects so that young people can better understand how they can contribute and where their interests might lie. Right. And, you know, it's something we think a lot about 
uh, Landscape Montero as an association, sort of on the you know bird's eye view level, you know how does the how does the profession uh, tell that story? How does an individual business tell the, you know their part in in that story in a way that's going to attract people? Do you think? Hopefully, that was one question. Yep, yep, and thank you. Um, so. If we if we go back to like the 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 young people piece of it, or even some vulnerable person sector, um, you know, people who've you know had a little trouble in life who may need a little bit of help, you know, often we don't think about them as viable candidates for our positions. But really, what I know in my life is, and so many people that I know, like when somebody gives us a chance, everything changes. Right. Like yeah. if, if there are no expectations or opportunities, we have nothing to live up to. Right. And so if we as an individual business owner or, you know, pieces of uh, pieces of our teams go out and they give time to inspire other people, then those people will, you know, reciprocity is, is, is a bit of a law. And, and you'll see that come back around. And I'm just thinking of some some times when I've gone to volunteer in places and then the people say, can I come and work for you? I wish I could work for someone like you, you know? And we think like, who am I to inspire somebody? Like I'm just some pink haired speaker who gets really excited on stage about marketing and recruiting. Like who am I, you know? But then I get a call from someone who's doing a Ted talk and needs a mentor. Like what a privilege, right? And so there are, you know, in the, in the Atlantic region, if, if you're listening from there, there's some really great apprenticeship opportunities that you can get involved with. Here in Ontario, there are two. Um, you know, I think about our specialist high skills major program. Um, all of our provinces and territories have skills, um, you know, Skills Canada, Competence, sure. and, you know, like being involved in those things really makes a difference. Or just Honestly, call your local high school or your local university or college that has a landscaping program and say, could I come in for, you know, an hour a week, whatever your class is, could I come and speak and, and show a different aspect of landscaping that your people may not be familiar with. And by the way, I'd love to do it in a science class, or I'd love to do it in a, uh, you know, a maths class, like just something totally unexpected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get guest speakers. Right. So that would be a really special thing. And you don't have to be a professional speaker to do it. You know, it's just kids looking for somebody to connect to. And if they can connect to you, they'll show loyalty as they grow. Yeah. And, and again, it, it, it's not just kids. It's people who've, you know, like I said, need a second chance too. From any walk of life. You sure. betcha. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can look at um, a little bit more of what um, the, con uh, the Congress um, talk is going to include. Mm -hmm. Just on a, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't need to dive into the whole uh, mm -hmm. kit and caboodle, but maybe if you could talk a little bit about some of the other topics you're going to touch on. Absolutely. So I'll give you the structure of the morning because it's a three hour workshop. So what we'll do is the first hour or so will be a pretty traditional uh, keynote presentation. So we'll talk about how um, interviews are traditionally done. We'll talk about why that doesn't work. And then I'll present a new opportunity for doing interviews and recruiting. So those go together. And then we'll take a short break, about 15 minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll actually dive into here's how to rewrite a job description right from the title to the end so that it can attract different people. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Now, circling back, you mentioned uh, a couple don'ts, I guess. One of them, I think, was, um, you know, about, um, you know, not just putting a generic sort of other duties. Mm -hmm. included. It's almost like a legal disclaimer, a lazy legal dis disclaimer. Any other, you know, really big red flag, like, don't do this in your job, uh, uh, your descriptions that you can think of that, uh, that you've seen? Uh, oh, boy. Um, so here's the thing when we're recruiting, like what we're really doing is marketing our company. And right. so we need to think about how would I, how do I want my customer in this case, a candidate or my employee, how do I want them to see this job, this company? Right. And so if you only talk about how great you are and don't say why somebody might want to be included in that then you're really, really missing the boat. Mm -hmm. 
you know? And one of the things that we can do is we can open with a question or we can end with questions in order to start a conversation in that person's mind. So those questions could be, uh, let me do this off the top of my head. So we'll go back to uh, independent maintenance technician, okay? So maybe one of the questions is, wouldn't it be great to work on your own and part of a team, right. right? And as part of a team. So like there are, you know, like really get people thinking. Yeah, pique their interest, mm -hmm. sort of get them putting themselves in that role and mm -hmm. looking at the, the possibilities. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Love it, yeah. Absolutely. Very good. Well, I'm thinking maybe maybe we leave it there. I'm hoping we've, you know, piqued people's interest to, to think about uh, the Congress and uh, where can people check out, uh, learn more about uh, about what you do, um, Alyssa. Can you can you plug a, a website or a? Okay, a, so my website's about to be redone. So the easiest place to find me right now is just on Facebook, and I am perfectly happy having the world add me on Facebook. That is fine. Um, and I actually go by Twist most of the time. That's my nickname. Right. It's much easier than trying to remember my first name. So if you just look up Alyssa Twist Light, I will come up. And that's the easiest way to get in touch. On Facebook, check it out. Mm -hmm. Definitely check out locongress.com um, and, and look at the conference program. When are you speaking? Do you, do you know? Am I I'm Thursday that? morning, if I remember correctly. Thursday morning. So that would be January, January 9th. Uh, yes. 2020, if you can believe it, we are uh, fast approaching 2020, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. The year flies by and, and here we go. I'm excited for another another Congress. It sounds like you are as well. I sure am. And, uh, I, I so appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with us and to chat with the Yellow uh, podcast audience. So thank you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Scott. Take care. Take care. Ooh.